very eminent surgeon and the teacher of teachers, Professor Chintamani sir. Uh, previously, we had uh, many webinars. Uh, the recent one was on uh, the common scenarios in the ward rounds, which was very popular and successful. And uh, today again, we uh, sir has uh, chosen a very important topic: approach to solitary thyroid duty. So we'll begin now, and over to you, sir. Good morning, sir, and a very warm welcome to you. Good morning. Thank you very much. First of all, our apologies for the delay. There were some issues with the Skype, so we want to make it absolutely. You are muted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, first of all, uh, do let me know if you can hear me. And we'll soon be sharing the screen also. Good morning to you all. Uh, I think we can hear all of you. You can hear me. And hopefully, we'll be able to start working straight away. Now, this was a demand by a lot of students. Uh, solitary thyroid nodule, invariably a question in the exam. And otherwise, also, that's the most common presentation of thyroid disorders that we know. It's not right. Eh? So we need to therefore understand it uh, in the current perspective uh, with the uh, well there are a couple of uh, YouTube videos mine on thyroid disorders but I think this one is especially important uh, because we will be able to deal with exclusively the solitary thyroid nodule and the way it should be approached. <coughs> the the whole concept of solitary thyroid nodule is based on understanding what is a solitary thyroid nodule. Now, any swelling in the thyroid gland or the nodule that is by itself alone and the rest of the gland is not palpable would make it solitary thyroid nodule. What does that mean? It is only that nodule that is palpable. The moment a gland is palpable, it is considered a diseased gland. So it is necessary to understand it that solitary thyroid nodule is a uh, is a is the only nodule. Now, very often you are asked a question in, in the exam of a dominant nodule. There is no such term as dominant nodule in in the clinical scenario. This term took its origin when we people are using scan as a mode of diagnosis, which is what meant by what was meant by a dominant nodule the one that picked up most of these uh, the isotope was called the dominant nodule now well that term is not used sometimes there are multiple uh, uh, multiple couple of nodules and then there is one which is larger than the rest that also is one way of looking at it so basically the first part of our job is to to understand that uh, Solitary thyroid nodule is a is an entity where that's the only nodule palpable and the rest of the gland is not palpable. I think this is a very important space, uh, statement. Rest gland is not palpable. Why do we say that? See, any gland that is palpable is diseased. So remember that, except in very thin individuals, very thin neck and very exceptional situations, there will be uh, no situation that you have the... Um, gland palpable and it is normal so palpable gland means diseased gland so that's the important thing now i touched on the uh, you know dominant nodule part because that's quite important very often i've seen this confusion happening if there are multiple nodules and this is one which is larger some people like to call it a dominant nodule but i don't think that's uh, necessarily a clinical way to approach it now when you when you think about uh, solitary thyroid nodule we are looking at say about 60 to 70 percent of uh, mode of presentation of thyroid disorders <clears throat> so to define it therefore palpable nodule in an otherwise palpable non-palpable gland that is a normal gland so i have clarified it further for you they are approximately seen in four to nine percent of patients, and if you add ultrasound, it increases to twenty-two percent. And therefore, we have the concept of triple test today or quadruple test today because it will uh, add to our diagnosis. And remember, only uh, thirty-eight percent of the clinically solitary nodules 
are solitary on higher resolution ultrasound so you clinically may find something less than what it actually is and presently ultrasound is a mandatory part of clinical examination and it is a, indeed an extension of um, the clinical examination so that's the definition of it and you should be clear on that so if you add clinical plus ultrasound especially the high resolution ultrasound you're likely to add to the tune of 30 percent more nodules so what you initially thought was solitary may not be solitary at all important therefore so you must be clear on that now most are benign which is good and uh, important it is yes mandatory to exclude malignancy and a higher risk of developing in thyroid cancer this is all that we need to do otherwise you can easily leave them alone now solitary thyroid nodules why should we why should we even bother we bother because they may turn to malignancy they may be malignant already or or there is a higher risk of developing thyroid cancer so therefore a trained effective safe and well-informed surgeon i've used too many terms here which i insist on must perform surgery as this may be associated with post-operative morbidity so every time just operating is not the solution it will be tailored to the surgeon to the center and as we say if you're not a safe thyroid surgeon which means a good volume surgeon it's likely that you will cause more harm than good because the morbidity is usually lasting the morbidity is usually lasting so it's important most are benign so you don't need to really worry uh, simply for the sake of operating you should not operate so once you made a clinical diagnosis how do you approach it and a lot of us are taught i have already covered it in some previous webinars triple test which is like in breast clinical examination imaging followed by fnac and in fact now the quadruple test wherever there is a high risk of malignancy and if we are looking at the familial or genetic basis to it then we need to look at the gene profile which is what is added so triple test is essentially clinical good history and when you're taking the history <coughs> excuse me what is important age is important we know that with agcca tradition of 55 years is the cutoff for the risk being higher and we have male gender is a high risk of malignancy although it's commoner in females but when it happens to males the risk of malignancy is higher tyroids is like biroids or pyroids in prostate lyroids in liver so we have the tyroids which is for thyroid so we have biroids in breast pyroids in prostate and lyroids in liver for imaging grading why do we need this kind of a staging this kind of an imaging remember an average radiologist who is not doing thyroid specially or is not a thyroid specialist like we have the breast radiologist we have thyroid radiologists also so an average radiologist may not be able to make the accurate diagnosis in a lot of cases and that's where it is necessary to uh, look for somebody who is uh, who is basically focused on thyroid now that is what we'll discuss in in details and then fnac which means fine needle aspiration cytology and specially ultrasound guided fnac and in fact these days image guided fnac is what is recommended and preferably a, a high resolution ultrasound guided uh, fnac there are scenarios where elastography is even more sensitive and we know that elastography depends on how much elastic is the, the the nodule if the nodule is more elastic it's less likely to be malignant so there is a grading for that which we will definitely cover and then finally we have to look at 
the management part of it now if the lady is anxious about it we need to consider it differently i put that cover on it so we, we won't presently look at it we look at it once we move to a situation if the patient is not anxious about it and it's a small nodule which is not causing any problem then we may not even bother to operate you may actually observe these patients so it is important to understand it so what 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 did i say in the triple test clinical which means history plus examination it should be thorough and in history certain histories are very important the age is important naturally gender is important then i mentioned that family history is important some cancers are in families especially the medullary which is not a true thyroid cancer but you must take a good family history and people are looking at papillary also in the same lines but it's not 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 as of now it's not been considered a significant factor then exposure to radiations is very very important and low dose radiation that is less than 20 centigrade and less than 20 years of age is a risk factor but a lot of people feel that even high dose radiations are not immune which means say for hodgkins or for mental radiation of the head and neck you may have actually a risk of papillary and also lymphoma so there is a risk with high dose also but it's more commonly the lower dose radiation because high dose radiation is supposed to ablate the gland so important and uh, when we look at the radiation exposure low dose radiation especially early in life can be a very important factor well in addition to that i mentioned about the other factors once you're taking the family then when you're examining a detailed examination in the form of whether it's a thyroid swelling or not whether it's a single nodule or not then it's consistency which is important and fixity which is important presence of lymph nodes in the neck it is important these are features that will contribute towards the risk or suspicion of malignancy so it's important to examine very thoroughly and if it is a suspected case of mean related disorder then we need to examine for all the other elements of mean which is which is quite important in most of the cases ultrasound that to high resolution ultrasound becomes necessary if we are looking at the making of a diagnosis and if you add elastography the grading can even improve and we can get a diagnosis even better we we'll look at it how do we grade them and finally fnac and we have heard of the bethesda staging for fnac which will help us so that is about in nutshell what we are planning to do and rarely the quadruple test is needed the ultrasound is graded using tyrides which is the same pattern as biorats or pyrats or lyrats as i mentioned and finally when you resolve when you've done an ultrasound and you do ultrasound guided fnac you'll have a final diagnosis and in rare cases you may do the gene panel which is uh if there is a high suspicion of malignancy you may actually do it and that will become a quadruple test so if you're asked a question about quadruple test that is what it is now before you do an fnac it is mandatory to do the total thyroid function tests especially tsh because you should avoid fnac in toxic patients so if there is a patient who is toxic that is there is a decreased tsh and if you do an fnac there is a risk of thyroid storm and also a risk of false positive I recommend that you watch the YouTube webinar of mine or uh, sorry panel discussion of mine on thyroid cancers where I've discussed it in details now false positive is a problem and thyroid storm is a problem false positive why if it's an active gland due to uh, hyperplasia then you can get some ATP ATP and the cytologist may actually get confused and may give a positive report for malignancy so that's important 
Now, so the take home for you, what should be your take home in evaluation? This slide can <coughs> sum it up. History and clinical examination. It amounts to repetition, but I'm insisting. Next is TSH. Then we do the ultrasound. And then the FNAC. And the ultrasound has to be high resolution. So is there any role of serum thyroglobulin in a routine scenario? The answer is no. And uh, is there any role of, I'm changing the color now. Is there any role of serum thyroglobulin? No. And there is no role of routine serum calcitonin. You will only do that after you've done the triple test. And if FNA is suggestive of medullary, then you will do that. I think that slide sums it all up. And what are the take take homes in the history? I'm summarizing it for all of you. Age, more than 55 years, increase the risk. Now this is AJCC, 8th edition. Male gender, females get it. The ladies get it more often. But when males get it, they get a worse cancer than females in terms of virulence or chances of it being malignant. Duration is important. Now, if it's a long-standing goiter, it's and in an endemic zone where there is an iodine deficiency, it is more likely to be follicular. Pay attention. Progression, if it is rapid, suspect it. Paleness becoming painful and mobile getting fixed or if there is involvement of recurrent laryngeal nerve, which means hoarseness will be significant. Compressive features are not a common feature initially, but yes, they will be taken into consideration. Malignancy is not compressive to begin with. It will be compressive only later when it's large in size, but mostly it is infiltrative, which means it will involve the surrounding structures. Look into the risk factors and the most important being, as I mentioned, the radiation. So the history of radiation becomes important. In fact, some books and some authors like to divide uh, thyroid cancers into radiation-exposed patients versus non-exposed. And the management is also different. And of course, the family history. That's the take home in your history. And age, I've already mentioned, will amount to some finer points. Pay attention. It's a complete story of solid thyroid nodule that you hear today. Now, the malignancy rate for nodules in childhood and adults is actually twice as high. So, younger age can make it a higher risk. About 70, the risk of malignancy is quadruple. So, you know, if the patient's age is taken seriously, this is where it matters. Above 70, the risk gets quadrupled. And the incidence of anaplastic carcinoma lymphoma increases with age. So, which age is likely to be anaplastic? Higher age. And which age is more likely to have lymphoma? Older patients, right? Now, age at diagnosis is an independent predictor factor, independent factor and we know about it. Age of diagnosis is identified as an independent predictor of disease specific survival. Now, we talk in terms of disease specific survival in thyroid cancers because it is possible that the thyroid cancer patients may survive for a long time. So, we talk in term, terms of 20 year survival. So, 20 year survival in papillary would make it difficult to conduct any prospective randomized control trials. So if you're asked a question, is it easy to do that in thyroid patients? The answer is no, it is not. I may take at some point a separate uh, class on thyroid cancers, but presently I'm taking it broadly, but you can hear it now also. So the it's not possible to do randomized controlled trials in thyroid patients because they they would be living for long and they're the they're sporadic and the since the patient lives long, it's very difficult to follow it up, which is good news, but uh, you have most of the data based on observational studies. TNM uh, was 45 earlier, now it is 55. So I think I've covered that. So that part takes care of the risk factors and we should be aware of 
the risk factors. Family history for the benefit of those who are academically very keen. The syndromes that are associated, familial adenomatosis, polyposis. So in your history, if you mention no family history suggestive of MEN or other familial disorders, the examiner will be tempted to ask you what are those and you can quickly rattle it loud. You can rattle it out by saying Gardner's familial adenomatous polyposis, Cowden's disease, Carnage complex. Carnage complex is actually often asked. It's thyroid pituitary gonadal adrenal atrial myxomas and skin pigmentation, but you should know about it. Cowden's disease, most of us know it's breast, uterine, thyroid, macrocephaly, GIT, brain. And in Gardner, we have the colonic predominantly and CNS uh, syndromes. On examination, I'm repeating the triple assessment, so please pay attention. Heart fixed, voice change, significant compressive features would go in favor of malignancy. Lymph nodes go in favor of malignancy, and metastatic foci will go in favor of malignancy. So you should be paying attention on that. Now, there are various ways to classify solid nodules. I'm talking, I'm just discussing one which we don't use anymore, but you should be aware of it. Because sometimes you may be asked or you should know in any case. Now there are there are various classifications. There's one based on isotope scan, where they we are doing scanning all the time. So most are you thyroid, so naturally that puts it off. For me, the indications for the scan would only be a hyperthyroid patient and a patient with ectopic gland. That is if there's a gland in uh, lingual thyroid or somewhere else you need to just exclude that by ultrasound even there we don't need it hot would mean automatic toxic nodule five percent nodules are hot with less than one percent risk of malignancy so hotter the nodule less the chances of malignancy and uh, the the total incidence of the incidence of hot nodules is about five percent if you do a scan and if you try to classify that would be hot. The cold nodule, which is more common, it is non-functioning, 80 to 85 percent cold on scintigraphy, with 14 to 22 percent ultimately proving to be malignant. So, colder the nodule, more chances of it being malignant. Hotter the nodule, less chances of it being malignant. The warm nodule may be a normally functioning nodule, that is 10 to 15 percent are warm on indeterminate they are also a risk factor and uh, they can have to the tune of 10 to 36 percent so you should be familiar with this figure it is just to let you know that cold and warm should be seriously thought as malignant we can i mean they can there are more chances of becoming malignant the reason <coughs> the reason is uh toxic less likely to be malignant why because malignancies do not do not produce thyroxine they're not hot they don't secrete they do not secrete so the chances are that you will have cold nodules being malignant so that is simple now <clears throat> Based on FNAC, I think that makes more sense to us. We have benign, which is about 60 to 75 percent. Now, they are colloid nodules in 90 percent cases, and chronic inflammatory lesions like Hashimoto's, Decare vein, which is about 10 percent. That's about it. So, 90 percent are colloid. So, if you get a report of colloid, don't be surprised. It's the most common one in a benign nodule, and about 3.5 to 5 percent are malignant and in insufficient means where you will see in Bethesda where we don't have enough material to report on which mean which would mean you repeat it if it comes out twice such and maybe thrice such then we go for hemithyroidectomy which is a minimum biopsy and say about 7 to 30 percent are in they are suspicious so this is just roughly the figure for each one but remember cold
टाई सी एंड वी डोंट नीड इट इच टाइम टू बी टेकिंग कोल्ड ऑल्सो एज मेलिग्नेंट बट मोर लाइकली टू बी मेलिग्नेंट एंड द कॉमनेस्ट वन इज ऑफ कोर्स कोलॉइड the rest are inflammatory say 10% which include hashimotos and uh, dq veins so about the the total percentage is 90 percent is colloid and 10% are inflammatory which will be chronic uh, i mean hashimotos and lymph lymphocytic thyroid etc so we'll have majority of them assessed based on our triple test and then and scan is not a part of the test so it's easy <coughs> how do you approach a diagnostic approach to <coughs> the solid thyroid nodule would be usually it is clinical assessment most of us are familiar with that it's an asymptomatic mass usually it's an incidental finding by patient or surgeon it's not always that patient can give you a very clear cut uh, history but you would generally be observing it yourself or the patient reality predictor of malignancy except calcitonin is almost diagnostic for medullary carcinoma so that's about the markers the laboratory tests are not so reliable the functional status we evaluate by doing the thyroid function test and we do that before doing any fnac and uh, if you are asked about the diagnostic or the biochemistry which is most sensitive it's a tsh or thyroid troponin assay which are most useful tests to perform this is to sum up what is it that you need in most cases a word about thyroglobulin level this is often discussed in most sittings you see it's a good predictor of i mean it's a good marker of recurrence but by itself uh, diagnostic thyroglobulin is not really a test that we need to do now the important one is antibodies which you do for hashimotos uh, hashimotos or lymphocytic thyroiditis otherwise 15 to 30 percent of patients with well differentiated thyroid cancer and 10 percent of the normal subjects, you will find that calcitonin and with a familial medullary thyroid carcinoma or MEN, you may you may need to do that. Otherwise, it is not recommended routinely. So routinely avoid it, but it may be indicated in some situations. Well, it keeps getting repeated, but I'm just highlighting some points. when grouping into cold and warm nodules together the sensitivity of scintigraphic scans for cancer diagnosis 89 to 90% but specific is 5% and positive predictive value of only 10% therefore scans don't really help in making of a diagnosis diagnosis they are useful in assessing the completeness of thyroidectomy and assessing for an indistinct metastasis otherwise they don't have a great role in otherwise suspected malignancy these are the limited indications of scintigraphy identification of functional thyroid nodule when initial tsh is decreased it has got a role these are the limited indications if you, i can sum it up for you functional thyroid nodule when i mean generally a toxic patient that is and if fnac is reported as follicular neoplasm <coughs> or there is a suspicious finding of a hot nodule this might decrease the suspicion of malignancy up to 10% carcinomas are functional this is the group where it may have a role <coughs> there should be suspicion otherwise and for of course picking up the neck metastasis so your answer in the exam is it may not be really needed but it can be a useful adjunct to fna recommended in some studies to differentiate between benign and malignant nodule especially if fnac is inconclusive 
but very limited and this is just for academic reasons that i'm discussing it here role of malignancy risk for malignancy for low uptake intermediate uptake so if there is a good uptake we don't normally label it as a malignant nodule so the risk of malignancy for low uptake intermediate and high uptake is see low uptake we have zero percent clearly indicating that if the nodule is picking up the isotope it's less likely to be uh, malignant six percent for the uh, intermediate uptake but 55% for the high uptake. And we actually do thallium scan also in some of these patients. So I think I'll skip that part. There's no definite role in, in each, I can't see the slide above. Put in the slide. Now, a word about CT scan and MRI. No definite definite role in the workup. Uh, so, thallium scan was the one slide that we wanted to. This is this is a very useful scan, especially when you're trying to look for. That's okay. Go to the next slide. It's a good adjunct to FNAC, especially, I'm just repeating that part because there was some overlap of slides. It's recommended in some studies to differentiate between benign and malignant. I'm talking about thallium scan. And initially I thought the, the slides, since there was an overlap, I thought that was for the technician scan. So technician scan has no role, but thallium scan, if there is a doubtful FNA to, which is inconclusive for uh, the follicular carcinoma, then you can go for the thallium. If there's no pickup, intermediate pickup and high pickup, you can see the suspicion for malignancy would increase. CT scan and MRI, they have no definite role in the initial workup. You know that CT scan is only done in a retrosternal extension or that is retroclavicular mediastinal extension or cervical metastasis. And usually it's a CT scan of the thorax and we want to look for uh, the extension into the mediastinum. So if there is, since we are, we don't want, we don't want to use a high iodine content. So a lot of people take non-contrast CT as effective. And mind you, non-contrast CT scan is nothing but a very good X-ray, which shows you how much is the extent of uh, the retrosternal extension. Actually, the iodine-based contrast might delay any nucleus integraphy for four to six, four to eight weeks. Therefore, it is not done in these patients. It may remain in the gland for at least four to six weeks. And we cannot do the next nuclear study, scintigraphy for another eight weeks. MRI naturally would show you more involvement of soft tissue and often you are asked, which would be an ideal test for the retrosternal extension. And a lot of us feel that MRI is useful. It also shows its relationship to the vessels also the status of the nerve and it's indicated especially in those patients where there is a recurrent laryngeal nerve involvement uh, the advantage over ct scan is a use of uh, the you can use a contrast which you cannot use in ct because you cannot use the uh, iodinated contrast easily as i mentioned it will stay and it'll be an artifact it will affect your other diagnostic scanning methods but MRI, you can use the gadolinium, so you have a possibility that you can use a contrast. And contrast, as you would understand, would help you make out the um, the whole gland much better. Well, that is the most useful uh, ultrasound approach. And when you're asked about what is high resolution ultrasound, it's a high frequency transducer which is 7 to 13 megahertz. You should know about it. They're often asking you, what is the difference in the probe that you use for the thyroid versus the one that you use for abdomen and neck in general? So this is for what we call as high resolution ultrasound. 
Now, modern ultrasound can detect nodules as small as 3 to 5 mm, and that is what has caused a lot of confusion also, because lots of incidentalomas and microcarcinomas are picked up, which may not actually need any definitive surgery, but they increase the risk of, I mean, they, they, put, they, they raise the level of anxiety in the patient. It can pick up the, if it is hydroechoic or hypoechoic uh, in up to 2 millimeters in diameter, so higher resolution ultrasound is modality of choice in imaging it is safe non-invasive and no radioactive test is needed and uh, the only catch with ultrasound is the same with FNAC is the same with similar tests is that it is operator dependent so dedicated um, thyroid sonologist would really help and it is advisable for a thyroid surgeon who does a good volume work to do his own ultrasounds because then he would be able to appreciate the extent of involvement and where to put in the needle for FNAC, etc. And this is on account of uh, the role of it being, this is an extended clinical examination and uh, it is the stethoscope of a surgeon. So we need to pay attention to high resolution ultrasound as the modality that we should look at. Now, okay, high resolution ultrasound has certain advantages, which will have some features that will be suspicious of malignancy. Some, you know, taller than wide, halo sign, increased vascularity, you can add Doppler to it. And uh, the whole idea is the diagnostic accuracy of ultrasound will be better. You have scoring models to categorize thyroid nodules, and we'll, I'll show you some images of that. CCT, I've already discussed it. FTG PET, most thyroid cancers won't require it. Not all of them are very avid also. But say medullary would be one place where you may find it useful because in medullary, we cannot do the, since it's not a true, uh, true thyroid cancer, so we may not be able to pick up the iodine because it's not iodine uh, receptive. So we may need a PET scan in these patients, and that is where it can it can be more useful. So features which would be suggestive of malignancy, I've already covered that. The absent halo, there's a halo usually around, which is the form of a capsule right i've already covered that part there is a solid or hypoecogenicity i mean a mixed pattern is more likely to be suggestive so heterogeneous ecostructure as i call it heteroechoic as i mentioned irregular margins fine calcifications very important and micro cals are very important to pick up and then, of course, extra glandular extension. These are features which would suggest it to be malignant. And I've covered that. I'll show you some pictures of the same if I can. Repeating the same thing. And uh, usually, we are uh, we are classically finding this in malignant nodules. Just to reinforce, this table should remain in your mind all the time. Margins, blood. Or ill defined halo rim absent, avascular shape irregular, spheroidal or tall. Spheroidal because central necrosis would make it bulge. Echo structure solid, echogenicity usually hypoechoic, calcifications, micro calcifications usually internal, vascular pattern intra glandular intranodular i'm sorry hypervascular elastography would be decreased elasticity i've already mentioned this so i'm just just putting the whole thing on the uh, in the form of a table so that you can remember and then of course abnormal lymphadenopathy which again you will find that the kidney shaped lymph node or the oblong lymph node becomes spheroidal because of central necrosis it has central area of hypoechoic uh, 
ligament, I mean, that's necrosis, and there is loss of fatty hilum, and of course, increased blood supply, which replaces the fatty hilum. These are all features which you would be asked anytime, and you should know. Now, well, there is based on neck sonography, we can divide them into benign or with low, very low suspicion or malignancy. They have low suspicion, but reasonable. Intermediate and high suspicion. So if you take the high suspicion ones first, the malignancy risk is about 70 to 90% in these. They are solid hypoechoic nodule or solid hyper hypoechoic component of a partially cystic nodule. One plus one or more than or the other features. Irregular margins, taller than wide, rim calcification, and extra thyroidal extension. The risk is high. Where is the risk? Very, very low and less than 3% risk. It's a documented evidence-based answer to most questions. Purely cystic nodules, which you can aspirate, they're cysts mostly, and you they may refill. If they refill twice, we then suspect them to be malignant. Or if it's hemorrhagic on aspiration, we suspect them to be malignant. If they're spongy form or partially cystic nodules, low suspicion, the malignancy risk is 5 to 10%. The partially cystic nodules with eccentric solid areas or solid hypoisoechoic areas you can capture this slide you will keep will need it and just put it across in if you have to answer this question in stn also on features just put this slide and that's the end of the story intermediate suspicion is <coughs> the risk is you saw that it's less than three percent five to twenty ten percent ten to twenty percent and then, of course, 70 to 90 percent. So they, they, that's how the risk stratification is done using ultrasound alone today. So do you understand the kind of role the sonologist plays in not only making a diagnosis of solid thyroid nodule, but also prognosticating? It is solid hypoechoic nodules with smooth margins. This is to summarize all that I've spoken. In a classical cystic nodule, the risk is less than 3%. In the one which is partially cystic and solid, but there are no other features, it's 5 to 10%. And if it is solid, but margins are smooth, it is about 10 to 20%. If it is a classical, all the features, taller than wide, all the other features, 70 to 90%. Important slide. In the entire presentation if you may now that's the role of elastography I don't know if you can see the complete slide but if you can then it shows you the um, part of it is in this slide high suspicion appearance and it's uh, due to the internet that we may actually be able to uh, may not be able to see very well but I think now it's visible now that is high suspicion so all the features that I described, this is elastography, okay? And uh, I'll just take you to the next other uh, aspects of it also. It's the role of elastography we're discussing. Suspicion 10 to 20%, low suspicion in 5 to 10%. And uh, these are all the grades and I won't get into the detail of it. The malignancy risk is in the order other way around. And that's the role of elastography. This is more of academic importance to you. You should know that it is useful. Then, of course, down to what we is the bread and butter, the false negative rates and false positive rates of FNAC. Important. What do you mean by false positive rates? You must be wondering, how can FNAC produce false positive rates? Well, the answer is simple. If you have a... <coughs> Excuse me. If you have a hyperplastic nodule, then you may actually get uh, lots of atypia, and you can get falsely labeled as malignant in that case. And the false negative rates are zero to sixteen percent, which is a range which is wide. But if you add ultrasound to uh, ultrasound to the FNA, 
then your sensitivity improves to nearly 95%, which is pretty, pretty, pretty good. So important to know that FNAC sensitivity can improve if we uh, if we have the ultrasound added to it. So FNAC remains the gold standard, and uh, we should stick to that as the gold standard. If you're asked a question as to what is the gold standard in the diagnosis of solitary thyroidology, the answer is FNAC. And what's the best mode of doing FNAC? Ultrasound guided. So what do I say now? I've improved it. Ultrasound guided FNAC is the gold standard. One, it is safe and quick. There's no radiation, radiation exposure. Ultrasound increases the yield. I've already discussed that. It decreases the cost of care by nearly 25%. You don't need to do scans. You don't need to do uh, PET scans. You don't need to do a lot of other investigations. And uh, in some studies, it been shown. it's cost effective. I just wanted to highlight that. To the tune of 50%, it may be reduced. So important. This is the Bethesda system. And the first one I've mentioned here, you know, this is the recommended system for most of us. The diagnostic category, risk of malignancy and management. <coughs> and the first one is non-diagnostic, which means you're not able to get adequate material, which is not great news. You should repeat with ultrasound guidance. So this is important to understand. Then, of course, unsatisfactory you know, clinical fault. That is unsatisfactory. Benign is 0 to 3. ATPA with this, you know, you would be asked sometimes in your um, exams as to what is ATPA of, ATP of undetermined significance or follicular lesions of undetermined significance. They are diagnosed based on high resolution ultrasound with FNAC together. And here, the pathologist would be leaving it to the surgeon to take a call. And most of us will be doing a hemithyroidectomy in these cases, which is the minimum biopsy, because this is where you are stuck. Follicular neoplasm or suspicious for follicular neoplasm, or what we call as SUSP. You do, this is seen in 15 to 30%, and you'll do a minimum biopsy of hemithyroidectomy. I am constantly reminded of the repeat business you must repeat it at least three times and six passes as is done in breast <coughs> if you still find it equivocal proceed with hemithyroidectomy lobectomy is a term that is used in us very commonly hemithyroidectomy is where you remove the low plus the stimulus and uh, this is what we practice so please read it as hemithyroidectomy in most cases <coughs> if it is suspicious for malignancy Lobectomy, near total or total thyroidectomy. That's the answer depending on the protocol of your unit. We'll discuss that. And if it is malignant, there's no shortcut, except in very, 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 very low risk malignancies, confined to one lobe. <coughs> and a patient who is not too fit, <coughs> excuse me, or where the surgeon is not very comfortable doing. Hemitha, total thyroidectomy. You may actually do hemithyroidectomy and proceed. Now there are limitations to FNAC, and like FNAC anywhere, it is subject to operator's uh, experience. So it's subjective. That itself uh, raises a point, uh, which is important. It's dependent on placement of the needle, which is the same thing, coming to subjectivity and sensitivity of the fingertips amount of suction applied and negative fnac may not be relevant although with high resolution ultrasound and in good hands it is the most sensitive investigation that you have and we can we will rely rely on it for most situations and there is a term which you hear very often especially in some american books fna b which is the slightly wider bone needle there is no case for doing 
core needle biopsy for three reasons. One is it will produce hemorrhage. Two, it may cause seedling. And three, it may damage vital structures like parathyroid or recurrent laryngeal nerve. So whenever we talk of the minimum biopsy, we talk of core bio, we talk of hemithyroid activity. That's the minimum biopsy. The minimum biopsy is hemithyroid activity. Important hemi. Mm -hmm. The usual. <coughs> There are some tests that also improve the accuracy of FNAC. I've mentioned about high resolution ultrasound, which is assisting in FNAC, but there are tests which can actually make it even more sensitive and better. You can add the immunohistochemistry, ploidy studies, which is important. You can use some molecular markers, which is what adds to the usual triple test. You can do RT PCR to detect thyroglobulins. MRNA, thyrotropin receptor, etc. Now, after this, I am not recommending you any book. This is the end of it. You should be, you should get all the information in this. Uh, in this presentation, we have covered all aspects, including the minor details of how to approach it. So this can actually help you improve the the sensitivity of. I think we'll stay the the it can improve the working of the FNAC even better and I'm not suggesting that they'll be routinely done now we have uh, done this study I think there's an overlap you can't see that so this is on use use of a marker that we worked on although we won't recommend it as a uh, standard of care but that can differentiate between follicular adenoma and follicular carcinoma if you study this micro follicular basement membrane that study this is published in um, the journal of diagnostic cytology so that uh, if you're interested you can go for it and you can study so we have found this to be very useful and the study we did in collaboration with in mass and Oksa who was the cytopathologist brilliant cytologist and this was uh, the absence of the basement membrane which was taken as a very reliable um, uh, as a useful marker I won't say very reliable so we won't recommend it there's studies that keep happening there are complications of FNAC which can be pain hematoma you can enter into trachea if you're clumsy it can cause transient thyroid swelling it can also cause cystic degeneration it can also cause transient bradycardia because of reflex bradycardia uh, very rarely transient vocal cord palsy has been reported. My, the, there can be calcification, which follows hematoma actually. And necrosis of the nodule has also been reported. But the important ones which are in red are to be remembered. You can have a capsular pseudo invasion and you can subsequently think you have breached the capsule. You can produce transient thyrotoxicosis and therefore you should not do this in patients with already established thyroid toxicosis or low TSH because it can precipitate thyroid storm it has happened so and of course it can cause a false rise in thyroglobulin levels because you breached it and you insulted it and that can give you a false basement reading so if the basement reading is false the rise due to this this is basement reading it may not be a very useful marker to study for the recurrence prediction, but these are rare complications. So ultrasound guided FNAC is simple colloid nodules constitute approximately 65 to 70 percent, while nearly 20 percent are possible follicular neoplasms, and that's where it becomes important. And uh, I won't get into the detail of it because I've already covered this. So the algorithm for diagnosis of thyroid nodule in most centers is now based on FNAC instead of isotope scintigraphy and ultrasound as initial steps. But we use high resolution ultrasound along with FNAC as a basic, basic approach. Now, this is a study that we did to see whether it is as sensitive as the, in a, in a normal case, if you have a patient that is 
post radiation exposed so radiation induced thyroid neoplasms will have a slightly more difficult outcome this was as you can see i had published it in 2003 and now we have already moved in an era that time ultrasound was not a routine protocol for fnac and here we had recommended that ultrasound guided fna can be a very useful way to reach it and get a diagnosis it is now an established practice so we already know it now the management algorithm for now we are down to the management so what do we do we have to you should repeat the fnac if the risk factors are the false negativity i'll skip this part we are rely, relying on the uh assessment of the uh the will manage the algorithm is now based on fnac as you can see and part of it is in this slide the other part is in the other slide so i'll take that one by one FNAC suggestive or benign nodules, we need to be follow it up, following it up with uh, ultrasound uh, and with ultrasound guided FNAC, which is already a protocol. Following that, repeat FNAC after six months. If it looks benign to you, that can reduce, especially in higher risk factor cases, it can reduce the negative, false negativity by 50%. I'm talking about how do we use FNA in the algorithm? <clears throat> the patient can be on thyroid suppressive therapy when if you use that as a short-term diagnostic tool is now obsolete many people ask you this question how about putting the patient on uh, some kind of a suppression therapy and then assessing the outcome known and the patient if the nodule disappears we think it is benign that's a that's no longer used we'll do the diagnosis beforehand uh, and as it is its role is only in 10 to 20 percent and we don't know whether it is working because it works by suppressing the wolf tykoff equation which is that it provides it reduces the tsh levels which would make the the nodule if it was tsh dependent especially in endemic zone will go i mean it will disappear or may reduce in size but not a very very and as a surgeon you should not swear by it it's not the best option and very rarely it's in the endocrine setup that people use it now what's the surgical approach and what algorithm we can follow is what i would like to now discuss because there are some guiding principles and then we'll get down to the individual uh, aspect to management the guiding principles in most cases surgery would be the treatment of choice if the patient has malignancy and there is no confusion about it and you all know that how much to do is although a little bit controversial which we'll address now because you may not need a whole lot of uh, i mean you may not need total thyroidectomy in all the patients that's what the controversy is about you may do with less and if you can might as well then follicular neoplasms on fnac should also undergo surgery now with the bethesda system in place why do we need bethesda system why do we need tyrads why do we need biorads it is to standardize the reporting so if there is a bethesda reporting we know where to do what i've already given that table so you should not be confused but when in doubt as i always say in surgery take it out so you should not leave it to become either toxic or malignant this is would be a blunder it's a good cancer to treat if it happens and if you can prevent it it's an ideal scenario to be in as a surgeon so follicular neoplasm and fnac the protocol we don't no longer encourage reporting by pathologist as follicular papillary etc they would report it and bethesda classification is mandatory if they do that then I've given you the guidelines, which are guidelines from the European Thyroid Association. <coughs> How much is optimum? There's a presentation of mine on surgery for thyroid cancers. How much is optimum? 
I'll repeat it here if you can watch that presentation on YouTube that will also help you despite the clear guidelines we are not sure as to what is low risk what is high risk so therefore should you go for maximum and it depends on the protocol you like to follow and uh, it is possible that you may do heavy thyroidectomy in a lot of these patients the lack of prospective randomized control trials for reasons which i have just mentioned to you why we can't have randomized control trials because you need large number of patients and long term follow up needed for satisfactory statistically significant outcomes which we don't unfortunately we cannot do in this scenario because most patients with this cancer they live reasonably long and which is good news but you can't conduct randomized prospective control trials so most of it is retrospective with its own limitation because retro retrospective data is almost always doubtful and prospective trial is always preferred <coughs> can surgery be tailored or can we do some risk stratification we know there are various methods amis gamis demis masses we are all aware of it and i must have discussed it many times the games is a memorial hospital which is grade added rest is like what you have in amis mayo clinic they have removed m they've got grade there so they're all working differently but they probably have the same logic in taking various parameters and you would see that age is a constant uh, constant uh, factor in this so grade age metastasis extension size is important age grade extension and size we know that size is the criteria age 55 and above presence of metastasis is a criteria extension outside the capsule is a criteria size is a criteria <coughs> the mayo clinic criteria and also sloan catering is masses where you take post surgery assessment for adjuvant therapy otherwise it is not pre-surgery so it doesn't have that advantage of risk stratification masses here means metastasis age completeness of thyroidectomy so if the thyroidectomy is complete or not you will only know after you've done the surgery and you've done a radio iodine scan and if the scan is pickup is less than three percent one to two percent we take it as r0 in thyroid because there's no true capsule so we cannot assess it simply based on histology but you will know only after this lie clinic relies on uh, amis it's an important clinic that works uh, and we have a lie swab based on the same clinic so age completeness of resection invasion and size that is the one criteria then age metastasis extension and size is the criteria of the lie clinic so <coughs> way back Karolinska institute had this dames criteria Where they took DNA ploidy that time. Now this is a part of our uh, quadruple test these days. So it was found to be a very useful. I mean, it was a great idea even at that point, but not easily available. And we do can't do it all the time. Gene paneling can be expensive, and therefore not a routine test. So rest is age, metastasis, extension, and size. So that fits into the criteria as we understood. So when in doubt, you should take it out. Most surgeons favor, this is the data, total thyroidectomy or near total for any patient with well-differentiated thyroid cancer, which is more than one centimeter. The only question they have is when it is less than one centimeter or a microcarcinoma. Well, this is an old slide, but I still defend it because of the simple reason we cannot do risk stratification very easily in most centers. But then I am also highlighting the fact that the surgery should be done by safe surgeon who has a good volume of thyroid surgery because otherwise the risk of the morbidity is lasting it has been observed in this study which i'll sh show you when the slide moves over to the next slide that total thyroidectomy reduces the risk of recurrence but there is no difference in the cause specific mortality 
and this was an observation in well differentiated thyroid cancers patients developing lung metastasis during their follow up were those where we had done less than total thyroidectomy and with radioactive iodine was not given so radioactive iodine is also very very important so these are some this is these are the guidelines and the data that i wanted to share with you so they had a higher though where we did less higher thyroglobulin levels after surgery and they required uh, treatment with iodine 131 and they displayed more tissue sorry with iodine 131 scan so there was a remnant disease in these cases that's just to highlight the total thyroidectomy is superior total naturally less than total is not the same outcome this is one stratification that i use personally use in our unit we have a high volume uh, thyroid so we can do it but it is a good way to stratify low risk patient and low risk tumor which means good grade small size okay low risk means less than 35 or less than 55 sorry and confined with one side we can do this is low risk you can do hemithyroidectomy low risk patient and high risk tumor you can go for hemi or total based on the local protocol which again would vary but you can take them as rough guidelines they're not gospels and if there is at the bottom high risk patient high risk tumor we may go for total thyroidectomy in most cases the only doubt was in the middle groups which are intermediate risk that is here and here it's a high risk patient low risk tumor or low risk patient and high risk tumor we can do hemi or total depending upon the protocol in the unit but as i said in the beginning if the disease is bilateral there is no confusion there is no confusion that we do total directly bilateral disease that is on one side on both sides and it's a low risk you'll still be doing total thyroidectomy. that's what i want to highlight right so important to understand that it also matters as to what protocol you follow in your unit what are high risk patients i mentioned that this is the protocol we follow high risk patient high risk tumor total thyroidectomy low risk patient low risk tumor you may do hemithyroidectomy and intermediate groups that is low risk patient high risk tumor high risk patient low risk tumor you can do hemi versus total but you need to again see whether it's unilateral or bilateral and then you'll tailor it to the patient and discuss it in the mdt but how do we classify them now this is now 55 years so this is an older slide 55 and less than 20 years so extremes of ages are a risk if the size of the nodule is more than four centimeters the risk is high the i told you about one centimeter so a lot of people have a doubt about one to four centimeter where again a lot of people do risk stratification more than four centimeters there is no confusion and tumors with extra glandular extension there is a case for doing total thyroidectomy if the regional or distant metastasis we do total thyroidectomy because we can then follow it up with thyroglobulin and also with uh, the radioactive iodine treatment if required and the histology is more aggressive it's a high risk tumor so these are the factors that indicate high versus low risk now there are some clinical features if you're not following any risk stratification and if you're asked in the exam so this slide is basically focused at all the postgraduates which warrant urgent attention surgery or where you should go in for surgery there are some clinical features which you should look at if you're asked very young very old so less than 20 more than 70 you should not waste time because these are the patients who are like to develop the anaplastic growth and the lower risk and less than 20 you have multiple i mean you have liver uh, lung uh, slips so i'm sorry lymph node metastasis more commonly history of increase that is rapid increase in size hoarseness cervical lymphadenopathy these are clinical scenarios there are more where you would look at other features also that it has got fixed and uh, uh, you are 
suspecting it to be malignant of course other features which i've already discussed this is just a summary of it where you have the uh, dysphagia dysphonia strider etc of course they are not difficult to understand family history we should be urgently looking at it they warrant attention is to your previous neck radiation as i mentioned in the beginning some people take it as a high risk nodule that is firm or hard and it's fixed to the adjacent structures all this would raise your chances of it being malignant now is an aggressive approach justified in the management of an aggressive cancer this i published some time ago which was to say yes it is justified uh, and uh, we can get a good outcome if we are aggressive because sometimes the disease can be so quickly moving that we need to be taking a cognizance of it and moving it so some decisions would depend on what features you look at now i think this i've covered so i'll move now high dose radiations were earlier thought to be protective against heart cancer but now we disagree on this there is a high risk especially in patients with hodgkin's disease and also papillary now the reasons for people resorting to total thyroidectomy in differentiated thyroid cancer is that they can be multicentricity that is why do it is the question i'm asking or i'm answering that that it can be multicentric so since the disease can be multicentric so we need to be careful and you may miss out although a lot of people feel that they are laboratory cancers only a lot of them don't grow up into true cancers so we can leave it that's a flip side of it the other advantage of doing it in differentiated thyroid cancer is you can deal with thyroid metastasis by ablating the gland if you ablate the gland completely then you can target the metastasis with the radioactive iodine so that's an advantage which you would miss if you do less than total and of course i've already told you about the role of you know you can you can do thyroglobulin as a marker except in about 10 percent individuals where there may be anti thyroglobulin antibodies which will give you a false negative false positive and any anaplastic chain you can pick up thyroglobulin levels as a marker of change or anaplastic change there are issues with complications issues with anaplastic change there are three red issues here which i mentioned which should define whether you can do it or not which should be deciding whether you can do it or not if you are a high volume center you should go for it because you will have less complications and in us these days they have benchmarking of surgeons who do thyroid surgery whether their outcome is good or not and depending upon your benchmarking you only should do thyroid surgery you cannot do total thyroidectomy if your risk equation is very high i can discuss that on some other day young versus old patients you can think of young being uh, total if you do total thyroidectomy what will happen uh, that you may actually uh, if you do total thyroidectomy you may have to put on supplement the young patient which can be a problem thyroxine for all life so you must take into consideration if it's a low risk tumor in a very young patient and if it is um, it is going to be for a long time we may do less than total thyroidectomy and there are issues with complications especially in in setups which are low volume so these are factors that you need to take into account before we go and we can discuss that we'll have questions later now five to ten percent recurrence rate in the opposite side so in favor for a total thyroidectomy, therefore, ten percent incidence of distant metastasis. So conservative surgery would be not really advisable; it won't be useful, also. And uh, we have an issue with local regional recurrence, which is about fourteen to nineteen percent in hemithyroidectomy, as opposed to only two to six percent with total thyroidectomy. So total thyroidectomy is going to produce lower local regional recurrence. Very important because it may not be overall survival that is different with less than total thyroidectomy, but the local regional recurrence 
is definitely low uh, is a factor now if there is anything which is slow here it's because of the internet connection so you kindly bear with us now we are doing our best to put it across to you now there is there are proponents of total therapy on this account inability to use iodine 131 is an issue which you should also look at there is a risk of de-differentiation with anaplastic transformation which is a huge disadvantage anaplastic carcinomas you do you you must understand although the only idea is local recurrence but the local recurrence usually is worse than the primary tumor in terms of the grade so you when you have a recurrence of a well differentiated thyroid cancer it may not be well differentiated it may be actually uh, anaplastic so it's important to understand that so what are the ultimate prognostic factors we are coming towards the end of it patient factors tumor factors now what are the patient factors age gender tumor factors grade size you you already know about it it's just a repetition to put it down in the tabular form on the other side extent of metastasis extent of the disease and metastasis and a very important and a very significant uh, risk factor that we should take into account now please don't get me wrong it is not that there are no other factors but if you are asked question ultimate prognostic factors which are the ultimate prognostic factors in the management of in the outcome of patient with thyroid disorders especially thyroid nodule patient related factors are age gender tumor related factors are grade size and extent and of course the surgeon which is also a important risk factor don't ignore this risk factor the one who is operating is important for is a, is a very very crucial contributor to the outcome because uh, the extent of surgery and the completeness of job decides the outcome in these patients and we should be very very cautious in knowing who is doing it so that will make a difference too so to sum it up there are many risk factors which you should look at and uh, the important ones are patient related tumor related age gender great size extent and of course uh, the surgeon now there are controversies and I'm not getting into there. We will keep it simple for you. Especially in the malignant thyroid nodule, there are controversies which you should look at. Uh, and uh, just give me a second. A lot of people feel there is no significance of clearing the last. Uh, uh cell from thyroid malignancy so a lot of people feel that uh, you don't need to actually take off the last possible cell you may not be able to now they also are of the opinion that it may not really matter because the outcome as it is is so good so even if you have some residual disease you can treat it by radioactive iodine especially in a thyroid which is a thyroid cancer which is differentiated well differentiated so it will respond and there is a significance of gland in, i mean the disease in the neck or in the thyroid gland it may not matter you'll have to bear with us there is a little problem with the net it's going slowly most people are on net these days so we are trying our best as i said so this would be there will be these are the parameters that you look at so there are controversy not a lot of people believe that you should do total thyroid in all the cases and that's their reason The prognostic factors are uncertain and uh, it is not that you need to take out every possible cell as I mentioned. The neck dissection is another factor that people look at. Do we need to do neck dissection or not? These are controversies and again I'll refer you to my own uh, YouTube uh, video on this 
discussion of extent of surgery for thyroid cancers and also the extent of neck dissection uh, the the talk which i delivered also at mamc update for all those who have watched it on youtube that question would be answered there but extent of neck dissection depends on so maybe you can check oh, with them whether they are able to see or not are you able to see the next slide please respond in the chat in the chat box can you see the slides clearly since the connection is slow we wanted to be doubly sure before we finish you can type type it in the chat box please we are waiting for your answer maybe about Controversy is the slide I'm seeing. Take it. Next slide. I need. Just the next. Just a bit of this here. Controversies. Yeah, that's the one which we have not moved. Yes. We're just trying to see if we can switch on to a better connection. Uh, We're trying to up, up, up. Just, just give us a moment. Meanwhile, I'll carry on, if, but the slide is not moving, so I'm just trying to... We can see what... Right? It was so few times. No issues. You can see this controversy. Yeah, I can't see it. It's quite understandable. Take this chat box away. You just about to finish otherwise. Come to the end. Was it one thirty one picker? Am I three? but slow I'm going back to malignant uh, the controversies so that you are able to see it just give us a yes or no so that we can start further can you hear me I think yes 12 points are missing great so thank you kush and others now controversies basically would be you 
you know there are a lot of people who feel why should we do total thyroidectomy and they don't think it is necessary to clear off every last cancer cell in differentiated thyroid cancer they feel that the laboratory cancer or the one that is called as multicentric may not actually effectively make a difference in the outcome and most of the time when we are talking about uh, thyroid cancers we don't talk about the survival per se we talk about recurrence free survival now uh, recurrence free survival is uh, what we are looking at and uh, the 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 whole idea here is whether we actually need to clear off the last possible cell or not and a lot of people feel that it may not be necessary to do total thyroidectomy this is on one account they talk about it and they also say that it doesn't really matter whether we get the complete clearance or not all that is controversial and debatable i may not agree with it some others may not agree with it is there any significance of residual disease in the gland neck or distant disease there is a significance because you cannot handle the distant disease unless you remove the entire thyroid gland so total thyroidectomy has that advantage less than total will take that option out of your equation now most of the prognostic factors are uncertain and uninvestigated and as i mentioned to you in the beginning it doesn't really matter uh, which prognostic factors you're relying on most of them are based on retrospective data and observational trial there are no prospective randomized control trials not because nobody wanted to do them but because it was not easy to do so so they are retrospective trials which don't really have a strong evidence as such and of course people are constantly harping on the point that the extent of neck dissection doesn't have an effect on the outcome although let me tell you i've discussed that before also the if the central compartment nodes some people like to take out routinely especially in the ipsilateral side they do so because if the central compartment nodes are positive the chances of lateral compartment nodes being positive are about 80 percent and that's a huge percentage vice versa is also true now if you have 80 percent chance of lateral compartment getting involved then we are looking at something huge so a lot of people like to do an elective neck dissection although that is controversial again i would refer you to my youtube video on optimum neck dissection in thyroid cancers the talk that i delivered at MAMSI update it's also on youtube i delivered at many places it, it, as a narration also at a couple of places so that will give you a complete answer to this question which is absolutely evidence based now the kind of evidence we have is where we have to rely or we don't have a very strong evidence to any effect now no risk stratification needed for this kind of a cancer you can see that there is a, there is a there is a thyroid nodule which is fixed then there are nodes you cannot do less than total thyroidectomy here so there's no confusion in my mind these cases that we get in indian scenario i had no choice but to go for total thyroidectomy along with central as well as modified radical neck dissection type 3 most of the time it is type 3 which is preserving the accessory the internal jugular and vein and the sternocleidomastoid muscle and we rarely do level one which is very rarely involved in thyroid malignancy so we don't need to do it all the time but we will be doing two three and four this is two three and four and this is level six here so we'll do all this in any case so here the decision is not difficult to make it's only in no negative patients that we have a confusion to make a diagnosis or to, or to plan our treatment well so there are some controversies and there is a slide to that effect hopefully i can show you that slide now this is a table that i've made for the benefit of all of you what is a surgical procedure of choice please concentrate on this table surgical procedure for differentiated thyroid cancer there are four groups when do we do hemithyroidectomy? When do we do total thyroidectomy? Now it is classically given here in a malignancy now. Unifocal thyroid cancer, which is less than one centimeter. 
No evidence of extrathyroid extension, no negative disease. Simple. So you can do hemi. If it is less than one centimeter. Important. Okay. And uh, the second is where I'm taking the other extreme. If it is more than Yeah, there is now if it is more than four centimeters or there are multiple nodes of papillary thyroid cancer with evidence of gross extra thyroid extension I would be doing lymph node dissection when I'm talking about lymph node dissection I've already described it level two three four rarely one and level six that's what we will do so only total thyroid activity is more than four centimeters but there's no evidence of gross extra thyroid extension and it is clinically n0 m0 important and remember the approach if less less than one centimeter you can safely do heavy thyroidectomy and be be completely safe there heavy thyroidectomy nothing changed anyway so this table is useful and if you can keep it with you it will be handy and you can actually summarize your treatment. Uh, I move to the next slide and the extent of surgery therefore can be divided less than one centimeter hemithyroidectomy more than four centimeter total thyroidectomy with extra thyroid extension and nodes present neck dissection between one and four I'll still be going for total thyroidectomy. I'll do total thyroidectomy. And total thyroidectomy without neck dissection unless there is a protocol. I personally like to do level six at the same time of total thyroidectomy because uh, it is easier technically and it is difficult to go back in a scarred neck. The chances of damage to the recurrent angel now and uh, and the um, the parathyroids is higher if I if I go second time. So it's important to have that consideration the overlap of slides is mainly on account of the network connection so we can't do much about that but I'm covering up both sides slides each time that I'm discussing so I'll take one centimeter and four centimeters as a cutoff less than one hemi more than four total if there are nodes present I'll do total directly with neck dissection that's an answer in the exam elective neck dissection is done level six if there's a high grade tumor high risk patient and if it's a protocol that you follow and if you can do it safely in your setup then it is possible otherwise one and four centimeter is how you look at it these are the two and in between is an intermediate risk group where again you may go by having a protocol of the unit now we're just about to take you through some of the steps of uh, what you do most of the time this is the protocol that you know these are my 10 commandments which is published and all of you should go through it it's there on the net it's also there in the PubMed not don't operate by clock position correctly and make right incision we normally put the patient in reverse tendon and bulk or barking dog position where the neck is extended or rose position flap should be raised right up to the head bone down to the sternocleidomastoid muscle search for the middle third vein always ligated before and I'm just rushing through it because it's already there on the YouTube you can watch my videos on this 
perform the medial dissection of the superior pole, always look for external laryngeal nerve, which we do in all cases by performing Niyas maneuver and opening up the cricothyroid space of reefs. And we do capsular dissection in main trunk of inferior thyroid arteries, never ligate it, but we do ligate the capsule branches only. Isolate all the four parathyroids, look for external laryngeal nerve. Isolate then all pedicles should be individually isolated. Ligating with the pole is an old method, no longer followed. We should not uh, do any ligation of the pole, no inferior thyroid uh, artery ligation, etc. And importantly, never operate by clock. I recommend that you watch this video on YouTube. So we'll save time on that. So those 10 commandments are for all of you. You can all follow. That's a rose position. You can see in this case by pictures I'll show. That's a gland, that's trachea. So head and is up, neck is extended. Head on the table is up. That reduces the venous congestion in the neck. But there's a risk it, risk it adds. That is, it may actually <coughs> increase the risk of air embolism. And that can be prevented by doing ligation in continuity. So ligate before you uh, cut any vessel in the neck. Now, marking the incision, usually we have a method of doing it, but many people like to use a silk thread. You can mark it, and, and the marking doesn't depend on having two centimeters above the, generally the two centimeters above uh, the, the um, attachment to the, I'm just trying to use a marker here. This is, the, this is probably the clavicle, and two centimeters superior to that, is where we normally have the incision, but classically you should mark it depending upon the build of the patient, status of the neck. Say in heavy breasted women, we try to make it higher because later on due to the weight of the breast, the scar may get dragged onto the sternum and produce keloids. So it needs to be planned based on the uh, situation. We usually cut the skin and platysma at different levels. You cut platysma a little higher, that reduces, that improves the cosmetic outcome. Uh, once the flaps are raised, they can be fixed with slings, which we use rubber slings. The superior flap we normally take up to the hyoid bone, not thyroid cartilage, as you've seen in most books. The idea is because we do central leg dissection also, and central compartment is from hyoid bone to suprasternal notch, from sternum to the sternum and actually carotid to carotid on either side. Uh, and so, so we must expose hyoid bone down to suprasternal notch, carotid on one side, and carotid on the other side and that's the level six which we must clear once you got it stab muscles can be separated or cut when you cut them you cut them as high as possible this is rushing through it then we look for the middle third vein any vein that crosses the common carotid to open into the internal jugular is a middle third vein and uh, we should like it all a lot of them all of them usually they can be more than one so we should uh, You should ligate all of them. They could be more than one, but you need to ligate them or use any device to cut them. And then we go, we ascend upwards, and that is how we reach for the superior pole, where we try to perform the Nihas maneuver, which is like we pull the lobe down and out to expose the cricothyroid space of reefs, which actually can be. Uh, Name the webcam is switched off. It's better. The space of reefs is created, which is called the cricothyroid space of reefs. And uh, we can actually find that the, the middle third veins can be ligated individually. And then we can flip the, then only we can flip the lobe to the other side. Very important step. And then we ascend up to reach the the superior pole and we try to go for the dissection in that region
opened up to take care of the uh, external laryngeal nerve. And this triangle is the cricothyroid space of reefs where you look for the external laryngeal nerve that is clearly visible here. Some of these steps, it's already there. As I said, please go through the YouTube videos and you must work hard at that. This is the external laryngeal nerve clearly shown in the, in the picture. And that's how you locate it. Must be seen in all the cases. We're soon going to publish our data that's seen in more than the percentage that the literature reports. Isolate the arteries, artery and the veins separately. And ligate artery and the veins separately because if you ligate them together, the chances of taking the nerve along are higher. Plus, you can produce an AV fistula, which should be avoided. And then this, this is how the parathyroid looks. And usually we identify parathyroids by their location. They're usually four in number, but in 5%, you can get five parathyroids. They're golden yellow to look at. Superior is usually fixed in position, which is what is here at the triangle created by the inferior thyroid artery crossing the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the sentinel pad of fat, which would be the, uh, which would be uh, a, a fat lobule that will guide you towards the parathyroid. It's important to understand that, that uh, it is guided, the sentinel acts as a guard. And remember, we are doing a probe test here. This is a forceps test, I call it. If you get close to the gland, it starts getting congested, which is to indicate, I tell my residents that it's getting angry, which would indicate that we are close to the parathyroid. And parathyroid is trying to warn you that you're too close for comfort. And in old Sebastian, I keep repeating, it is written that parathyroid looks like the tongue of a jaundiced hummingbird. A bird rarely seen thumb-sized with uh, flutter producing the, uh, the sound of hum. You wait for it to get jaundiced. Are expected to stick out the tongue look at its color that's the color of the parathyroid gland well that's a polite way of saying you'll never see it forget it therefore in the past the dictum was seen is damaged so don't try to see it just to support the thyroid we leave it all behind nowadays the dictum is not seen is damaged you must see parathyroid in all cases and you can see the recurrent laryngeal nerve is also clearly visible Some of these steps, that's a, that's a forceps test for uh, the parathyroid. And uh, before we approach it, you can see that it is inferior parathyroid. You can see that it is getting congested. That's hemithyroidic. We get a part of the, we normally take a part of the, this is the left-sided, right-sided hemithyroidectomy. And uh, we will be, uh, I hope you can see the, change in the screen now there's a slight delay in the transmission to you but you can see it now the part of the opposite lobe a bit of it we remove and isthmus plus the lobe is removed so that is what becomes that is what is called hemithyroidectomy and if performed on both sides it is called total thyroidectomy. Make sure total thyroidectomy is nothing but preserving external laryngeal nerve on both sides, recurrent laryngeal nerve on both sides, two parathyroids on either side, which makes it four glands, four nerves. Preserve it, rest you can remove. That is total thyroidectomy. Well, I'll skip this part. So, by and large, some anomalies can bother you. This is a tubercle of Zucker candle, which is an extension, posterior lateral extension of a lobe. There are various grades to it. You can again read my article in the PubMed on tubercle of Zucker candle as a friend of a surgeon. Because as you lift it, you can see the recurrent angel nerve right underneath. And the parathyroid is clearly seen. You can see the sentinel fat of pad and also the parathyroid, which is here. And the sentinel pad of fat is above that. So the sentinel pad of fat can actually make you identify the parathyroid in most cases. Correct. So that's how you'll find it in most cases. And uh, tubercle of Zucker candle is a friend of a surgeon. You can see the recurrent angel now right there as you lift it up. More pick.
pictures, pyramidal lobe is also to be removed in most cases, which is usually the seat of recurrence of thyrotoxicosis. And the isthmus is a very active site for a recurrence of thyroid nodule coming back. I didn't say, I, I, I pardon me, I said thyrotoxicosis. I mean, recurrence of thyroid gland uh, related um, issues. So it can be benign conditions also where it can come back and produce thyrotoxicosis. Now, if you're doing central neck dissection along with it, like in this lady, you will have to perform total thyroidectomy and uh, locate the recurrent laryngeal love, as you can see here, and trace it right up. You can see the nodes above. These are the nodes. And that's the nerve. I can go along this nerve. And this is inferior thyroid artery, right down here. Now, you need to, uh, I can show you with the cursor. It would be visible, I'm sure. Okay, now we'll do the central compartment dissection and we'll trace it right up to the uh, entry of the recurrent angel nerve and the point where it crosses. And uh, this would mean uh, that we can go right into the caucus tunnel where we have reached. And you can see again inferior thyroid artery, which I'm pointing as I here. And that's the recurrent angel nerve, which I'm pointing as R here. And you can see that the nerve is going in between the branches, which is here somewhere. You need to make sure that you dissect it cleanly and you're able to get all the lymph nodes cleared in this region, which is necessary, which is mandatory. How do we use the cursor? Is it possible? Is it possible? Then it's okay, we're just finishing. I think, I think leave it. I think leave it. No, no, I'm getting confused. Okay, so clutter. Let's finish. Can you just show the screen? Okay, I'm not doing it. Now this is capsular dissection, as you can see, and we are proceeding in this direction. Uh, hopefully, you can see the. Marking this is the carotid and we have gone right there. Well, I'm you can watch my video in this uh, connection Because uh, the internet is not so good here. So we are not able to move it on the iPad I'm not able to draw it. So otherwise I would have loved to show you that way. Never mind We carry out this the section which is central central quadrant and the entire thing is lifted up completely. Please watch this video. This is a these are parts of the video only the central leg dissection has been performed and you can see the carotid there you can see the gland being lifted up of the carotid and uh, once we uh, have lifted up the gland as well as the central compartment nodes we can clear off from the recurrent angel nerve on the left side and in fifth head artery is clearly seen so that's how it proceeds so we need to clear off from vein to vein as they say and uh, Finally, it will be very close to where the berries ligament is, which is visible in the picture that will probably appear on your screen now. It's going slowly. I can already see it going. And uh, yes, so you can see the inferior third artery is on a sling, and the nerve is crossing over it, and the nerve is branching into two. And there is a little bit of a caterpillar hump, as you can see, before it enters. So you should not be uh, callous close to the ligament of bedding. And we dissect all the lymphatics around the uh, inferior thyroid artery to make it uh, uh, make it happen. So the dissection has to be complete, and then the specimen along with the lymph nodes will be delivered. See the idea of showing you these pictures is not to describe the technique because for that you need to watch my video which you can see. There's plenty of them on YouTube that are relating to total thyroid to neck dissection. The specimen along with the central compartment is visible and we will remove it to get a picture which will be something like the next slide that you're probably going to see where you can see that total thyroid is completed and you can see level 2 level 3, level 4, and level 6 all cleared. Now recurrent angel nerve 
central compartment and all the levels can be seen clearly. I'll urge you to have a look at the video of the same because you can't play the video here and discuss. We'll probably have questions at the end. So this is the circle details that we wanted to share with you. You can very clearly see the central pad of fat here and the this is the central pad of fat and you can see the parathyroid very clearly, the recurrent angel now very clearly, external angel now very clearly and the cent and the thyroid force is on clear. So you can actually appreciate that the clearance would be a little bit of an effort but needs to be done carefully then you can get the outcome that you're looking for. Central compartment dissection is done in all node positive cases, whether it's lateral nodes positive or central compartment node positive, based on ultrasound. And if you're doing central leg dissection, the lateral leg dissection becomes a natural extension because the chances of the lateral leg being positive are around uh, 80%. Now, I think the rest would be most more or less the the slides that you would possibly see in some of the presentations and uh, i would conclude by saying that solid thyroid nodule is to be approached the way i basically discussed with you today, and you should be uh, focusing on its description more importantly in your clinical setting and clinical examination and the central neck neck dissection shown in this picture from vein to vein from hyoid bone to suprasternal notch and the both the parathyroids on either side and external angulum and recurrent angulum must be preserved. Generally, you will have some questions relating to the surgery, relating to the extent of it, and most of it is going to be beneficial for you when you're writing your answers in the exam or otherwise managing these patients in your clinical practice. Now, I won't get into the details of the technique anymore. I think I'll wind up here. By summarizing, the solid thyroid nodule is one entity that you would almost always get in the exam. You can see in this picture the vagus nerve, the common carotid, the internal jugular vein. That's just a magnified picture of the previous previous uh, dissection that you saw. Now I'll be um, touching on. I will take your questions uh, as soon as we are ready with it, and we'll hope hope that the network connection is good. If I can't draw it on the on the slide then I'll probably answer it by speaking to you this is how it looks from front this is a frontal view of the same now with that I'll conclude it and solitary thyroid nodule is the most common presentation of thyroid swelling so therefore if at all we are looking at it we should look at it with uh, with it's being a very very important mode of discussion presentation about solitary thyroid nodule now I'll be very happy to take your questions now if there are any questions please Write them and I'm So, Dr. Asit is asking, uh, differentiated thyroid cancer, if less than 4 centimeter, can we do lobectomy if low risk? I already answered that. So, that is probably answered. So, you, you asked the question too soon, but I'll repeat it. Uh, one is, uh, if lobectomy is a very, I'm going to use the term hemithyroidectomy, I'll be happier. Uh, in a low risk, you can do hemithyroidectomy, but needs to be a good risk stratification. And I have divided them into low risk patients, low risk tumor, high risk patient, high risk tumors, low risk patient, high risk patient, tumor, high risk patient, low risk tumor. So four categories. You can do hemithyroidectomy only in the first one, according to me. Uh, but if it is four centimeters and above, and it's just confined to one lobe, patient is young, and uh, it's a differentiated thyroid cancer with a good grade. We can do hemithyroidectomy. I'm not saying I'm not recommending it because there are advantages of doing total thyroid queen thyroid cancer because my personal answer is that it's a cancer which is a good one where we can offer our best uh, knockout so we should go for total thyroid we provided you can do it safely I think that's a big factor in in all over the world the reason why a lot of people are proponents of hemithyroidic is because at least you will not hurt the patient so that's that's the answer to the question but mostly low risk patients low risk tumor even if it is four centimeters we can do hemithyroidic 
So his next question is uh, regarding the management of Trigo Malaysia in post-op and intra-op in long-standing huge quarter. Okay, Trigo Malaysia is usually a phenomenon post-surgery. It's nothing like per-operative. So Trigo Malaysia would happen, uh, first of all, anticipated. Therefore, we work up the patient properly. I didn't get into the workup, which where you need to do an X-ray soft tissue neck to look at the tracheal compression. And if it's a long-standing goiter and there is tracheal compression, there are more than likely chances that you will get it. So anticipate it. That's the first thing. Second, if you've anticipated it and during surgery, you feel that the cartilage is soft, which is usually a surgeon's assessment. Then we can put some heating sutures from the cartilage to the strap muscles. And... Uh, this is called hitching technique. You can stretch it. You can suture it to the uh, to the strap muscles. Now, in the immediate, uh, as soon as the patient is to be reversed, we want the anesthetist that we are looking at uh, a trachea which is not so good. It's softer. So, while extubating, the the anesthetist would be extremely careful at uh, being ready with another tube to put in and re. The patient may be intubated for a while longer. Later on, post-surgery, the fibrosis keeps the trachea from collapsing. What we have done with the skin, with the hitching sutures, we have kept it away anyway. Now, with post-surgery, as it is, it will not collapse. So, we rarely require tracheostomy these days. So, tracheal hitch and uh, intubation for a little while longer and anticipating it. This, this is the way to manage it. So the next question is by George Anthony. What is the difference between uh, American, American Thyroid Association, Association and risk stratification and others? And others. Uh, uh, which, which they all may more or less similar. Well, there is, I, with the risk stratification which I have given you is the one that you can follow. I have given both ATA and ETA, uh, but the risk stratification to be is to be used if you are a high volume center. Otherwise, when in doubt, take it out. You'll have to do your maximum. But the common one is the one that most people use is AMIS uh, and MASIS because post-surgery in MDT, you can discuss based on completeness of surgery, whether the patient would require adjuvant radioactive iodine or not, because that's a big catch. Whether you need adjuvant radi radioactive iodine or not, that is to be decided based on your completeness of surgery and also the assessment in scan. And I said, if the scan pickup is more than Two to three percent, we take it as positive. If it is less than two to three percent, we take it as R zero, which is corresponding to not much disease left behind. It can then be handled by radioactive iodine. Now, to use ATA is more, it's easier to follow. Next. So, Asif is requesting you to uh, please ex mention the cricothyroid space again uh, to see the external angle. Well, cricothyroid space of Reeves is created when you pull the lobe down and out. What it does is this is how. If you can see my finger, uh, this is how the, uh, this is trachea. Suppose I put it the other way around. This is trachea, my prone, the, the supinated finger or the palmar side is trachea. This is the gland. So I'll pull the gland down and out. So this is open, opening up a space. And this space is where the nerve is. It's called cricothyroid space of Reeves by opening it up. Down, see, farther I went laterally and out, out. And down I pulled it. So I created a space which is the triangular space where the lobe is below, and this is where the nerve would be traversing. That's a cricothyroid space of Reeves. So Varsha is asking if you could explain regarding the radio iodine whole body scan that is done post total thyroidectomy for differentiated thyroid cancer. When do they proceed with it? Indication and what are the percentage remnant? Good question. Now, uh, the uh, the scan should be done when the TSH levels are more than, say, 20 to 25 units, which would mean that you keep the patient off thyroxine for at least four to six weeks. You want a hungry thyroid so that it can pick up all the isotope, right? And needless to say, you'll need iodine-131 because that's got a longer, uh, you know, shorter half-life. Sorry. You want it to be washed up quickly. So... We need a high TSH level, which means a four to six weeks patient should be kept off that or should be on recombinant, which is, is where the signal don't appear. So, the so this, this is, is the way you prepare it. Now, if the, if the pickup is less than two to three percent, which I've already mentioned, it's taking less. 
and usually they pick up of more 10% to 15%. Most of them, I mean, to a great degree, radioactive iodine can knock it off. We don't, we don't go, go in for surgery, surgery unless, unless the, the decision in the MDT is that radioactive iodine, iodine dose is going to be extremely high, high or, the or the patient is say anyone who's a reproductive age group because this can produce infertility. And you need to go for a, cut, a re, redo surgery only if we are um, we are not able to knock it off with the But a very high dose is not great. So next is by Dr. Shantanu uh, to explain the to, to explain again the extent of surgery for one centimeter and four centimeter. Uh, well, I've explained it thrice, so I hope Shantanu you are paying attention. Now uh, the the extent is totally dependent on the risk stratification, and one of them is the risk based on size, not all, only size. So if it is one less than one centimeter hemi more than four centimeter total but if it is one to four centimeter in a patient who's more than 55 years with a poor grade with a strong family history or with exposure to radiation i'll do total therapy. number two if it's a low risk patient young patient and the size is between one to four i can do hemi because somebody has asked that question already so risk stratification is not just size but usually more than four centimeters, there is no confusion. Most people would like to do total thyroid because the chances of contralateral microfoci is pretty high and they have a higher recurrence rate. So, therefore, more than four centimeters, somebody asked previously, can we do hemi? I mentioned that very, very, very low risk patients, but we will prefer to do total. One to four, you can take a decision based on other risk factors. So, if it is, if you go to that table which I've shown, I think that will answer your question. If the patient has no extra thyroidal spread, if it is a mobile normal gland, no, 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 I mean, lymph nodes, if there are lymph nodes, then we are going for total thyroid anyway. So those factors would come in handy. So Dr. Pragati is asking if you could elaborate on the de differentiation in anaplastic carcinoma. <coughs> anaplastic carcinoma is de differentiation only, so there is nothing to describe there. De differentiation means when a well differentiated thyroid cancer becomes less well differentiated or becomes poorly differentiated. That's the definition of de-differentiation. Anaplastic is the ultimate term. So there is no de-differentiation in anaplastic. What the term is the trick taken as is if there was a well differentiated thyroid cancer and if it recurs or if it is long standing and you have not done adequate job, it can come back as poorly differentiated, which is not de-differentiated, which is de-differentiated, but it's not an anaplastic. Anaplastic is extreme stage when you may not be able to do surgery adequately because it's not like thyroid cancer anymore. It won't take up any radioactive iodine. And also, uh, you do core biopsy because you may not do surgery. You may just clear off the isthmus and provide the patient radiation. This is one indication for putting the patient on external beam radiation therapy. So, de differentiation of any differentiated cancer can be into anaplastic. So, Dr. Adnan Khan is asking if uh, how can we prepare a hypothyroid patient for emergency surgery? No, Hi. we don't need to highlight emergency surgery. Then it distracts me. Now, uh, hypothyroid patient for surgery of, say, acute abdomen is a risk for anesthesia, not for surgeon. So, the anesthetist has to use shorter acting agents because they take longer to wash out their uh, anesthetic drugs. And what does that do? That can actually make it, uh, that can actually make it, uh, uh, what was I saying? That can actually make it difficult for the anesthetist for reversal. So therefore, we will be doing surgery as a high risk scenario. And there is a case for giving these patients Thyroxine preoperatively, but where is the time? So it's a risk that you take, and there is a case for using some kind of recombinant, but I'm not suggesting that it will happen easily. So the anesthetists will have a risk. They may have to probably intubate, keep the patient in reversal. They will reverse it gradually. That's the issue they need to work at. Next is then what should be, what is the initial diagnostic investigation for? Solid, solitary thyroid nodule, solitary thyroid swelling. I have mentioned that. I think the initial, there's nothing like 
uh, what is initial. We'll do a triple test and high resolution ultrasound will be before we do FNAC. An ultrasound guided FNAC, even before you do FNAC, we need to do thyroxine assessment of the thyroid function test. Because if the patient is thyrotoxic, FNAC may induce thyrotoxic and actually high resolution ultrasound is a is a useful adjunct. So therefore, the first investigation, if you ask me, you're answering the exam because you may run into somebody who may ask you, no, we don't do ultrasound. Although they are not right, but they have to know it to know that you're right. You would say, I'll do FNAC, preferably ultrasound guided. So that's the answer to your question. But before doing it, I would do thyroid function tests. So that is necessary for initiating the most important investigation, that is FNAC. You can do it. So Dr. <laughs> Shiva Kamish is asking to discuss for the thyroxine treatment and thyroglobulin levels post total thyroidectomy in cases of thyroid cancer. I think I've covered that. So we put patient on thyroxine treatment uh, because we do the thyroglobin assessment at least yearly. Follow up is also yearly. We don't do a definitive invasive test unless we've got a thyroglobin levels. Which rise and uh, uh, the the usual follow up is six months and one year every year. One year every year. For high risk patients, there can be a there's an algorithm of follow up which is given in NCCN guidelines <coughs> that you can again follow up in my YouTube video on the management of thyroid cancers, the controversies, etc. But importantly, what will you do? You will use thyroglobulin before you do uh, investigations, invasive investigations. But ultrasound can be done as a routine follow up. So, Dr. Uh, George is asking uh, it would, which risk stratification to choose. Can we highlight it? I've already answered that. Uh, you can use either of them, but the most common is the Mayo Clinic, which is safer and better and easier to do. So you can follow any, they're all equally good. And may, we can create our own also, but unfortunately most centers don't follow the risk stratification right. So therefore uh, we may we may actually use either of them. But the one which is easier to follow is the Mayo Clinic. Next question. So Dr. Sanjay Sana is asking the role of antithyroid drugs preoperatively. Well, in a toxic patient, we need to make him use thyroid so that we can operate. The whole idea is that we want to operate. So you don't treat them simply on drugs. So patient is put on antithyroid drugs. It's such time that the toxic features subside. And when you put the patient on antithyroid drugs, there is also a case for putting on a patient on beta blockers. And usually selective beta blockers because they all usually will have respiratory problems also. Now beta blockers actually block the receptors where the thyroxine would act, and they actually reduce the toxicity, and we are able to make a hyperthyroid patient in the thyroid that take up for surgery. So depending upon how long you need it, you give it. And most antithyroid drugs will produce, especially the new it produces a bone marrow suppression. So so throat and any infections should warn you that your problem is to uh, going to be uh, toxic. So we prepare the patient using antithyroid drugs and beta blockers. But the important part is that we use them before surgery, during surgery, and post surgery because the, the handling of the gland can produce thyroid stone. So you should go through the beta blocker should stay throughout. What lymph nodes routinely removed in lateral lymph node dissection? I think done I for metastatic that. disease. I probably think you probably you did not connect at that time or you may not you not able to see it clearly it's possible i'll answer that to you rarely is level one involved in thyroid cancer so a lot of people do not remove level one level one a and b would mean some mental and some medical routinely we remove level two three four and five but more importantly level six so two three four six that's how i would call it two three four five and six if it's a node positive disease we will not do selective dissection. No positive, no negative disease. We can do selective dissection, two, three, four, and six, and then you move in that case. 
but level five is almost commonly most commonly involved so answer is mrnd type 3 bar and the level one but if it is involved and if it is palpable and if it's confirmed a involved node that is spheroidal rather than oblong central area or extra capsular spread in the form of absent hello site we'll go for level one also what are the options if we encounter RNA injury paraoperatively? The nerve, if found to be injured paraoperatively, must, 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 must be repaired. And for that, to have good training, good lighting, and a good magnification. If required, the repair can be done without a cable graft. It's a very, very, it's possible to mobilize it a little bit. But it is a very, um, um, uh, you know, it's ischemia prone now. So most of the damage is been induced. But if you if you watch a transit, then it has to be repaired perfectly. If you cannot do repair for optically and you think you're going to damage them further, it is help for somebody who can do it for you. If you don't have the help also, which is disastrous, you can then explain to the patient and patient can be shifted to another center where it can be done. In the immediate in next period or later on it is safer in these patients that we are going for repair to use the nerve stimulation and many a time let me tell you the mode of recurrent laryngeal nerve injury are not just transaction ischemia also is an injury sometimes the cuff of the endotracheal tube if inflated too much by the anesthetist can cause stretch injury and stretch injury during surgery can also come but if detected for it should be one should be attempt to repair and we will obviously use 6280 uh, suture with a good magnification using good corneal loops. It is possible to do a uh, heart surgeon who's regularly doing the surgery to actually perform it. You need to mobilize it a little bit. And usually you don't use a chunk of it. If you lost a chunk of it, then you need a cable, and that can be something which will be. So next, Dr. Asit Chakravarti is asking the superior parathyroid and inferior thyroid position in thyroid operation. I think that's pretty basic, uh, but uh, I think if you are listening to me, superior is usually fixed in location, and uh, they are called superior and inferior, not based on uh, just the the location, which is in relation to inferior thyroid artery. They're superior to that or inferior to that. Classical location for superior thyroid artery, which is fixed in location, is. Inferior goes places, it goes along with thymus, so it can go to mediastinum. The superior is where the there is a little triangle formed by the crossing of the inferior thyroid artery over the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the trachea here. So there's a space here which is very complicated by superior thyroid parathyroid. And you can dissecting in the superior hole, you can actually see it. Now, can I no, I think I've shown it already, so you can go back and look at the PPT that I shared. I'll see if I can change so to show the picture at the end because we take more questions. Although I covered it, I'm repeating it. This is like an angel now, and that's the inferior thyroid artery. This is where the parathyroid is, if that is right here. So, Dr. Shantan is asking if you could please explain the post open role of radioactive iodine as the connection was. Okay, yes, I doctor. think that's why a lot of questions are coming for this thing. Uh, most of the radiation therapy is based on the remnant tissue and also for the metastasis if they are distant metastasis. If the remnant tissue, of people take as more than 20%, 20%, some take as 30%, some take as 10%. It is discussed in MDT with a nuclear medicine specialist who will decide when to do it. But whenever indicated, it is uh, done uh, taking into account its side effects. So you should not. Iodine is absolutely without side effects. It can actually be with side effects. So we are not uh, not safe in giving it to everybody. So and during this period, the patient can be aware of everybody. Even his urine is to be collected and exposed. This will be basically a nuclear and nuclear will be all uh, coming up. Usually for remnant disease and for metastasis, for metastasis, we use radioactive iodine. And uh, remnant in the neck versus remnant in the chest can be new. So I thought that was covered there. But usually in an R1 resection, when it's more than 3%, 4%, 4 
we have tissue. So personally, I would go for one fourth of the glands can be radiated. Some people like to go for one lobe to be knocked off, but it's not safe. It has a toxicity. This, uh, this toxicity. So the ones ask, we can differentiate follicular cancer from platinum definition. No, we cannot, and it's very basic. Uh, you need a capital information and uh, vascular information, so you need a issue for that. Uh, I can tell you quickly uh, the minimum biopsy is hemithyroidectomy when you can actually find it out. Dr. Mohammed Aftab is asking if it is a benign swelling, then uh, when we should offer surgery? If it's a benign swelling, we offer surgery as a planned case whenever the patient is willing and you're ready to have your work done. The patient, patient is fit for surgery. There's no reason to delay. There's no emergency, but there's no reason to delay it. So Sankit Sharma is asking when to do thyroid function test after surgery. Well, that's a good question. Depends on what surgery you've done. If you've done total thyroidectomy uh, and if you're planning a scan, thyroid function test can be done anytime. But you'll normally find that the TSH will be raising after uh, two or three weeks uh, with the half-life of thyroxine getting over, your gland would start asking for it and that TSH will start rising. So it would help you decide as to how much of thyroxine should be given to the patient. And if the patient is planned for the uh, scan, then we probably may not be, uh, then we may actually not give radio, the thyroxine to these patients. And you can do thyroid suction tests about four to six weeks subsequently. So Dr. Uh, Vishnu Vardhan is asking, what are the new techniques for? I, I mentioned that. I think I must, you must have paid, you should have paid attention. Uh, where I described the thallium scan, but that's not it's done if the risk is high. And you found that if the heart uptake is uh, high, then the risk is high. 78% uptake, 0% uptake, 3 to 10%. I've shown it in the slide. So please go through the part of the presentation. But by and large, you should not answer in the exam that you can differentiate between follicular and adenoma and carcinoma based on ethnicity alone. So Sankit Sharma is asking what should be, sorry, Dr. Adnan is asking what should be done if we encounter extensive bleeding during thyroidectomy. Now, extensive bleeding during thyroidectomy, you need to manage the bleeding. What else to do? You need to, don't like it, then if you thyroid artery, most of the bleeding can be managed by uh, patients, pressure, packing, and uh, prayer. So you must not be impatient because you'll cause more damage by rushing and catching. The usual way, there is no rocket science here. It's the same management. You should be meticulous in your dissection, prevent it from happening if it is happening. You, if you're asking me ligate, external carotid, like if it's hard, that's a wrong way to manage it. The management is meticulous. Apply pressure, it stops. Pressure on the gland and gradually catch each bleeder. Use diathermy rather than monopodiathermy. Do not use artery forces to catch blindly. You will damage parathyroid. You can damage recurrent nerve. Do not use, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, in a callous way, I don't want to use the term, uh, stopping the bleeding. Now, if you can stop it at all, you need to apply pressure and call for help. There is no one answer to that. Can you ligate superior thyroid artery? And uh, superior thyroid artery will be ligated anyway, so you can ligate that. And inferior thyroid vein, you can ligate that. Can you ligate in the inferior thyroid artery? You should not, unless you made sure that the, the parathyroids have been supplied. But if you're desperate and parathyroids have been supplied and you're beyond it, you can ligate it. And if you're doing only on one side, the other side is all intact. Then that desperate situation, you can do it. Some old books describe putting a vascular clamp on the inferior thyroid artery, provided you could see it, and then trying to control the bleeding and remove it. But my answer to the question is absolutely patient dissection, packing, and uh, pray and ask for help. So next, uh, Dr. Sankit is asking the same question. So, Dr. Sushrut is asking probe test or forceps test while operating on thyroid. What exactly was it? Nothing. I just showed you that the moment you get close to the parathyroid, it starts getting congested. 
which is to indicate that it, it indicates that it is parathyroid and not fat lobule. So I call it forceps test. It's given in no book. So don't quote me if you tell me. Uh, the whole idea is you can say that the moment we get close to the parathyroid gland, it starts getting congested. And I teach my residents that this is getting angry. And it's telling us, stay away, I'm parathyroid. So that's one way to pick it up. But golden yellow color, location, superior is fixed in location, inferior goes places. Sometimes you find inferior parathyroid also on the thyrothymic ligament, thyrothymic ligament, sorry. And you can get an extra parathyroid in about 5%, also in the thy thyrothymic ligament. So you should dissect cleanly. And thyroid surgery is for those who are meticulous and slow, and uh, they perform their surgery clearly. Somebody asked about pyrates and Sir, Chan pyrates. Is, Dr. Chan is asking that Virat scoring is by mammography, pyrates is by MRI, tyrates is by high resolution ultrasound. So what is, why is such difference in this study? No, no, this, is got, this question has no basis and you should try and understand. There's no difference. You, you pick up the most sensitive uh, imaging for individuals. So what is most sensitive for breast? Mammography. What is most sensitive for thyroid? Ultrasound. What is most sensitive for prostate? MRI. So it depends on the most sensitive imaging. So don't don't get carried away by terms and don't get find try to find minor questions that are nothing. Importantly, this is an imaging standard which we practice world over, right? And you need to use what is most sensitive imaging for that. So I'm not undermining your question, although you you asked in good faith for the benefit of others. I'm repeating it. Don't get carried away by semantics. Understand the logic. The logic is why Virats in the first place. Virats was there because we have to standardize mammographic reporting. These people would report in a bizarre way at various places. So they standardized. Why why for liver the Lirats? Why for say the Virats? Because people were reporting differently. So it's to standardize your imaging, basically. So Dr. Sumit is asking. See one thyroid question, thyroid. how can you identify parathyroid during surgery? I am repeating again because I am surprised that you probably were disconnected at that time, repeating fifth time, but I'll do it. Now note it down somewhere. We recognize parathyroid during surgery first by looking at where it is located. Superior is fixed in location, inferior is not. Because superior comes down with it comes down with the inferior comes down with the thalamus. Which goes to medias. Right? Superior is classically located in the triangle created by crossing over of the inferior, th para inferior third artery, uh, and the recurrent as it enters the air, uh, the glycopharyngeus. So that's a triangle where it is usually found. Number two, we recognize it by the sentinel pad of fat, which guides us towards parathyroid. Third, we look localize it by the color that is golden yellow. Four, we localize it by the change in color that you can find. That should be finally clear. So, Dr. Sumit is asking, uh, do we need to do search for benign thyroid swelling? If patient is not willing for the surgery in view of benign swelling, what should be the further plan of management? Observe and surveillance. I don't recommend uh, thyroxine supplements in these patients, although there is a role in endemic goiters, especially the colloids. You can put the patient on thyroxine. I'll keep the patient in close follow up. And if the patient is not willing, we can't force it. But if the patient comes back to you, we should not delay, deny it also. So Dr. Sanjay is asking, screening for thyroid cancer in a patient of hypo or hyperthyroidism without a obviously no, without an obvious module. There's no, no such screening modality as of now. And uh, ultrasound is still the best. But why should we do it is the question. If the patient is normal, you thyroid, there's no problem. Why should I screen a patient? It'll only be done if we need to. For the reasons that there is a nodule, that's only when, when, when we try to find out. Now, accidentally done ultrasounds of the neck can pick up incidentalomas, which may not be needing surgery, but sometimes we are forced because the patient is at a risk. But then you can do a higher resolution ultrasound guided FNA and also elastography. That can help you. Screening is Patients symptomatic, then we can find out. So there is no screening for thyroid cancers. Either. So Dr. Samkit is asking uh, again the TFT post-op and calcium level when to do. See, calcium level I have ans not answered because the initial question was thyroid function test. Post-total thyroid activity, always write you written total. You have not written total thyroid activity, so it's very important to write it. 
you don't total thyroidectomy, we need to assess for the uh, ionized calcium as well as total calcium. So it depends on what you're talking about. If you're looking for total calcium, it is after 48 hours because in 48 hours you would still have the calcium that was there already in the system working. 48 hours following that, or whenever the patient develops symptoms of hypocalcemia like tetany or the Schwastex is positive, etc., then we do it. Otherwise, we need to do it 48 hours later. The ionized calcium, and also, a lot of us like to do the uh, phosphate. Yes, please. So, Dr. Adnan Khan is asking our radio iodine therapy versus thyroidectomy in Graves' disease, which one should be preferred in 30 years later? In a 30 years lady, we will be discussing it in the MDT. And since you're mentioning Graves, I think Graves has a very big advantage with surgery because usually Graves is associated with the exhaust helmos, which gets resolved with total thyroidectomy better than with radioactive IOD. But that's an option. Since the lady is 30 years old, she should be prepared to be infertile subsequently. The, the radioactive IOD is not a great choice, personally. And again, Graves' disease may be with, with or without goiter. That's another question. Usually by this time, there would be a little primary, thyroid, since it is primary, there may be goiter. If there is goiter, then we go for surgery. That's a preferred treatment. But, and surgery, if there is a, if there is exhaust thelmos, it is a better option because it resolves that those eye signs disappear quickly. Quick, two more questions and then we'll wind up. Can we? So his next question is, can both chocolate and put We can. So that was the last question. And uh, the, since we have time, so one minute. So <clears throat> remember, Graves' disease per se can be treated by both options. Again, as I said, we should discuss it in the MDT. MDT is for this only because we, we find there is uh, uh, an opinion made by uh, all of us, including nuclear medicine specialists. But as I mentioned, if there are eye signs which are called exothelmos, surgery is an option, and that should be given. And you very cleverly mentioned 30 years, which actually makes it better to go for surgery because radioactive iodine, with the dose that you will need, can produce issues with fertility. If the patient is willing for infert those issues, then we can opt for either of the two. Patient unfit for surgery, you don't have a choice. But generally, fit for surgery, patient is made you thyroid, and we can go for surgery. Right. If there are any more questions, any questions that we missed out? Here? So post-operative calcium levels, importantly, 48 hours after surgery, but that's when you'll get it. Uh... So George Anthony was asking how much residual gland on radioactive iodine scan can be removed by surgery or by radioactive ablation? Should be removed by surgery or radioactive ablation? I covered it, but I'll repeat it. Uh, it'll again depend on whether your nuclear medicine specialist is willing to knock it off completely, patient is willing to go for surgery again or not, that's also an option. Otherwise, right up to, as I mentioned, 20, 25 to 30 percent can be knocked off. And if it is a very small uh, amount, then it is an advantage because you'll give very low dose of radioactive iodine and you can get a clearance. But in situations where you think it's a recurrence of disease in the form of lymph node or you forgot how forgot that it's a lymph node, the surgery does a slightly better job. But radioactive iodine can be given. And uh, our nuclear medicine specialist is capable of knocking off one lobe, which is a high dose. And I don't think it's strongly recommended, up to 25 to 30%. Again, you can watch uh, the uh, my YouTube video on a panel discussion on thyroid cancers, what is optimum, where I've covered this extensively. So you, your question is very valid and very useful. Most of you have asked very good question and don't be disappointed if I said the question was uh, very basic. You should ask me basic questions too. And I hope I could answer all those questions. Which two questions? Sir, Dr. Asit asking bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy post-operative management. And Dr. Aftab is asking how to manage post-operative recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, unilateral as well as bilateral. That's a good question, Asit, and uh, I'll take it. Now, Remember, if we have a cadaveric position, which is a bilateral cadaver, uh, the recurrent laryngeal nerve injury, the cords lie in, there is a space in between, you know, but with external laryngeal and both go on, then they close. Invariably, this would be detected on the table, and patient may need to be 
in some situations tracheostomized and then you hope to work at your cords now if the cords are paralyzed you have options sometimes if it is just a neuropraxia due to stretching as i said it might recover and over a period of time you may need to take care of the vocal cords if they're in adapted position but they're paramedian you can still have some air going the patient would have strider if the cord is not moving at all you can inject teflon and uh, that can be done through the endo endotracheal route teflon injection can make it stiff so it'll stay where it is if it is unilateral that's what is usually the method otherwise you may need to work at the uh, the the uh, repair if possible if you can get it done at least on one side otherwise you may have to do the tracheostomy and hope for the neuropraxia to recover if you have transacted i've already answered that you should try to repair it bilaterally with the unilateral injury that uh, nan was asking you can have the patient breathing all right but there is a hoarseness of voice sometimes even that recovers over a period of time it depends whether it's transient or permanent if it is permanent and we need to inject teflon into the vocal cord but bilateral both nerves everything in general you have no choice but to go for tracheostomy and hope for the best and preferably the nerve should be repaired under the my operating microscope along with the stimulator the nerve stimulator which you should know nerve stimulator whenever it is used we advise the anesthetist not to use the the blockhead or the uh, relaxants because it will not let the stimulator function so doctor uh, the second question by asit doctor asit was draft mutation study is it must or selective cases very good question i skipped it because this was there in some slides which you probably could not see and i could show uh, braf uh, mutation is done routinely in all high risk thyroid cancers differential thyroid cancer especially peptidary now there are three reasons why braf mutation should be done one it's a part of the gene panel that we do in the quadruple test in a high risk patient and uh, the reason why we do it is because this is a group of patients that are radioactive iodine resistant and if you rely on radioactive iodine in the adjuvant setting they are not the best patients to handle so surgery has to be more aggressive in these if you have to take a decision on hemi versus total and no dissection central compartment elective neck dissection braf mutation is a very important criteria so in all patients with braf mutation you should know that it's a high risk patient the tumor is also high risk total thyroidectomy is mandatory and central neck dissection is mandatory because you will not be able to treat the remnant disease with radioactive iodine i'm repeating braf mutation patients would have a resistance to radioactive iodine treatment so even the detection would be a difficulty treatment would be a difficulty so we should do that in high risk individuals or patient with a family history or also in patient with the insular types of uh, the tall variant all cell variant and insular types of peptidic cancer but that's a good question i hope i could answer that so there was one uh, one more question by dr shantanu uh, role of frozen section converting can uh, henley to total thyroidectomy another very good question shantanu uh, some people practice this routinely some people don't i can tell you what caucus institute does and many people do uh, they do a frozen at the time of surgery only so that they don't have to go in second time but there is a sensitivity of frozen also it is correct only in about 70 to 80 percent cases because the gland may not freeze completely so in that case you may miss out they are false negative then what do you do you will again rely on ultimate pathology but if you do frozen especially why do i do hemithyroidectomy with the isthmus and the part of the opposite side taken because these are the most common sites for recurrence this is where the activity happens maximum so if i take the isthmus out along with the margin of the opposite lobe then that's a portion which is more likely to be yielding me any signs or the the causes of recurrence which will happen now this is indicated if you doubt it but some people centers do it as a routine so that they don't have to go in second time but it will finally be the histology which will get subsequently that will take a decision that will take that's where you take a call but it's useful you can avoid 
a good percentage of 80% is a big percentage you can actually avoid a sickness. Good question. That should be it. Yes, sir. So, uh, Dr. Asit asking why technician scan is better than iodine scan. Well, uh, I won't say it better or in worse. It's just the time it takes. The, the nuclear medicine people are happy with technician because, uh, you know, radioactive iodine uh, is not picked up by some tumors as well. So there are there's no better or inferior. It totally is a decision and a call by nuclear medicine specialists. Most of them prefer technetium scan because it's quicker and it shows up much better. That's the only reason. And especially the contrast, if you've done a CT scan before, you use contrast and CT scan, it can be also an issue. So I don't think there's a huge difference, but it totally depends on the call that nuclear medicine specialists would take. So I hope with that. If you could type your yes, that you've been able to listen to us and uh, you enjoyed it as much as we enjoy getting it to you, in spite of the difficulty, technical issues with, uh, with the network. Now, could you kindly type in the space that you probably were able to hear me right through and you could make use of the interactive session that we had? I hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed getting it to you. With that, uh, we concluded. If there's still more questions, we'll be happy to take it subsequently. In many webinars that we'll do, I'll do one exclusively on the extent of thyroidectomy. So that's short crisp. But this was a general approach to solving the nodule. Thank you very much. And once again, I would like to thank uh, all of you for being patient and being there. And we apologize for the poor network connection in between and the Catches that happen, and thank you so conducting it. Thank you so much. I hope you found it useful. Over to you, Raksha. So thank you very much for uh, the valuable time so you give every uh, week for teaching us and taking all the the queries which we have regarding the topic in detail. So thank you so much. You're welcome all the time. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.